1 Samuel chapter 11, and we'll start reading at verse number 1. <clears throat> then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for reproach upon all Israel. I just really don't know why David mourned when this man died. But anyways, that's a different passage of Scripture that we're not looking at this evening. But anyways, that's his covenant that he's willing to make. Thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for reproach upon all Israel. And the elders of Jabesh said unto him, Give us seven days' respite, that we may send messengers unto all the coasts of Israel. And then, if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul and told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field. And Saul said, What aileth the people that they weep? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings. And his anger was kindled greatly. And he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces and sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. And when he numbered them in Bezek, the children of Israel were 300,000, and the men of Judah 30,000. And they said unto the messengers that came, Thus shall ye say unto the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow by that time the sun be hot, ye shall have help. And the messengers came and showed it to the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. Therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will come out unto you, and ye shall do with us all that seemeth good unto you. And it was so on the morrow that Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the host in the morning watch, and slew the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it came to pass that they which remained were scattered, so that two of them were not left together. And the people said unto Samuel, Who is he that said, Saul shall not reign, shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. And Saul said, There shall not a man be put to death this day, for today the Lord hath wrought salvation in Israel. Then said Samuel to the people, Come and let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. And all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they sacrificed sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this text that we're considering this evening as we think of uh, the deliverance of Jabesh Gilead this day when Saul was made king. And Lord, as we consider this text before us this evening, I pray that we will make application to our hearts and see what a great Savior we have. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. As we've been going through these opening chapters of Saul, up to this point, we know that Saul is king, that he's been anointed king of Israel. In fact, we saw last time that he was publicly chosen in front of everyone to be king of Israel. So there's no denying the fact that Saul's chosen to be king. However, up to this point, the people have yet to make him king. In fact, in our text, where we find Saul is in the exact same place that we saw him when we were first introduced to him. He's out after the flock. <laughs> He's out chasing his father's flock, taking care of the flock. And this is the day, though, when all that changes. This is the day that he saves Jabesh Gilead. It's the day that through him the Lord wrought a great salvation in Israel. 
It's the day that he became a savior to them. And so in verse 15, this is the day where it says, And there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. This is the day that Saul was made king. And you know, while we know that later on, not in the too distant future either, later on Saul is going to be a bad example. We're going to look at Saul and we're going to see what not to do. But tonight, Saul's still a good example in our text. He's someone who is a good example for us to follow. Because in this text, do you know who Saul actually reminds us of? Saul ring, rots, the Lord uses Saul to bring about salvation for Israel. So he reminds us of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has brought a great salvation for us. Because remember, our Savior, he, is, he was anointed king. Remember when he was baptized in the Jordan River, the Spirit descended on him like a dove, and there came a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He is anointed by the Father. And Psalm 2 makes it clear he is anointed. And he says of that anointed one, the anointed son, I have set my king in Zion. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the king. But ultimately, although he's declared king, we recognize him as our king because of his work of salvation. We recognize him as our king. That day we crown him king in our hearts and lives is the day that he saved us. And, you know, when you think of this, I'd like to take these Old Testament texts and if I, I'd like to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you think of this text and pointing it to Christ, we know that this is a literal event that the Lord recorded for us. This is literal what happened with King Saul in Israel. And uh, we always got to be careful not to take our theology necessarily from these instances but we can take the theology that we have and we can apply it to what we see in these passages of Scripture. And when I think of Saul in this passage of Scripture, I'm reminded of our Lord Jesus Christ as our deliverer. I think you can apply it personally or you can apply it prophetically. You can think prophetically of, this is a great passage that points to what Jesus is going to do in the future. There will be a time of great trouble. For seven years, the great tribulation period, at the end of that seven years of great trouble, there will be a great deliverance when our Lord returns with his hosts, executes judgment upon all, and delivers the nation of Israel. And then there will be a day of great grace. And I did just give you your outline there. <laughs> there will be a day of great grace when they look on him whom they pierced and crown him as king. And so it prophetically points to that. But personally, it reminds me of what the Lord did for me when he saved my soul. Reminds me of what he did for me on Calvary's tree when he died for my sins. And what he did for me in saving me from wrath, saving me from sin through shedding his own precious blood. And so tonight, uh, the application that I'm going to make is personal. Uh, even as Christians, we can see the Lord as our deliverer and make application from that. But uh, I want to take us back this evening to the day you got saved. Take you back to the day when you saw Jesus Christ as your Savior. When you crowned him as Lord in your life. When you acknowledged him as King. When he saved you from your sin. And the day that Saul was crowned King in our text reminds us of that day. First of all, we remember that it was a day of great trouble. It was a day of great trouble. Our text opens with a great enemy, their great enemy in verses 1 to 2. And listen to our text describes what's happening in Jabesh Gilead in verses 1 to 3. It says, Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. 
And the elders of Jabesh said unto him, Give us seven days respite, that we may send messengers unto all the coasts of Israel. And then if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. It was a great enemy. We're introduced to Nahash the Ammonite. And I think, needless to say, Nahash reminds us of the devil. What he's doing, the way he's talking, what he's promising to do. Nobody is going to remind you more of the devil than Nahash. And then you throw in the fact that his name, Nahash, literally means serpent. It means snake. He literally reminds us of the devil. And in our text, Nahash the, Enem- the Ammonite has encamped against the city, a city of Israel, encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And apparently just his being there was enough for them to give up in despair. Apparently his host was just so mighty, his men just so fierce, that Jabesh Gilead, rather than organizing any form of resistance, rather than trying to stand and fight at all, they immediately go out and make, try to make a covenant with him. Except we always should know, you can't negotiate with the devil. He doesn't play fair. You can't negotiate with Satan. And in the text, we see why. Uh, what should the men of Jabesh Gilead have done? Well, it seems that in their mind, there just was no, they couldn't pray to God. In their mind, their initial reaction was to make peace with the devil rather than calling on the name of the Lord. And so they try to negotiate with the devil. They're trying to seek a covenant with Nahash the Ammonite, the snake king. And what kind of covenant does he offer them? He says in verse number two, on this condition will I make a covenant with you that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. Here we see the devil's ploy. This is what he wants to do to us. Thrust out their eyes. I mean, that's, that's disgusting. That's vile. That's just pure evil. That's terrible. You say, who would do such a thing? The devil, that's who. The devil would do such a thing. The devil is a destroyer, a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And if you'll let him do it, the devil will do anything to hurt you. And the thrusting out of their eyes, their right eye specifically, would have made them blind soldiers. As the way they fought in those days was they had their left eye behind their shield and they looked out with their right eye. And so if you're a soldier and you have no right eye, you're a blind soldier. You're a useless soldier. You're a soldier that has no chance in the fight. And that's what the devil wants. He doesn't want us to be able to fight in the battle. He wants to render us useless, to render us helpless. He wants to leave us unable of advancing forward. He wants to bring a reproach, this text reminds us. A reproach against all of God's people. Notice that if he just does this to Jabesh Gilead, it will be a reproach in verse 2 upon all Israel, the whole nation. Do you realize that your testimony affects others? Do you realize that we represent each other? We represent the people of God? And we must endeavor to have a good testimony for him. And this evening, as we think of Saul being crowned king, it starts with this day of trouble where this great enemy is attacking Jabesh Gilead. We see the great enemy. Secondly, here we see their great weakness. Their great weakness. In verse 3, the men of Jabesh Gilead, they just boggle my mind because there's no resistance. In fact, it would appear that they're willing to just let this happen. They say, this is what we'll do. In verse number three, the elders of Jabesh said unto him, Give us seven days respite that we may send messengers unto all the coasts of Israel. And then if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. 
Really? <laughs> but what we need to understand is that they just, they were hopeless. They were helpless. They actually didn't have the means to defend themselves. They didn't have the strength to defend themselves. They were hopeless against Nahash the Ammonite. And don't you remember that's how we were with the Christ our King? That's how we were against the devil when we were in Satan's kingdom. We too were without hope. We too were without God, unable to save ourselves. No means of rescuing ourselves from the clutches of Satan. No means of delivering ourselves from the bondage of sin. The devil was having his way with us. It was a day of great trouble with a great enemy and great weakness. And thirdly, here we see that their great sorrow. In verse number four, then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul and told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. They just, they cried, they wept. Nobody was able to come out and defend Jabesh Gilead. They just wept when they heard it. You know, that's the response that Nahash was going for. You say, why did Nahash let this message go to all of Israel? Because he wanted all of Israel to tremble before him. He wanted all of Israel to be in this pit of despair, feeling hopeless, feeling like there was nothing they could do, but to let Nahash, the Ammonite, the serpent king, have his way. And so the people lifted up their voice to weep because there was no one there was no one who was able to save them except we're going to see there was one there was a man in the nation of israel that god had prepared for such a time as this there was a man who was there who god had anointed king who was to lead the armies of his people who was ready to save them and they didn't need to weep. They just needed to go and tell the king what was going on. You know, I'm reminded of the book of Revelation when John is weeping as the Lord, as God the Father is on the throne and there's this book with the seven seals and John is weeping because there's no man that is found in heaven or in earth who is able to open the book and to re release the seals and to look thereon. Nobody is found worthy. And John stands there and weeps because there's no man there like Jabesh Gilead, like you and I in our sin. And except then, Revelation 5, 5 says, Then one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, the spirit, seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. No need for us to weep. It was a day of great trouble when Saul came to save them and was made their king, just like it was a day of great trouble when Jesus saved us from our sin. Then secondly, it was a day of great deliverance, a day of great deliverance. With great trouble comes great deliverance. Think of verse, let's read verse 5 down to verse 11. It says, And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field. And Saul said, What aileth the people that they weep? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul. And when he heard those tidings, and his anger was kindled greatly. And he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces and sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, 
And they came out with one consent. First of all, we see in this his great zeal. His great zeal. Saul was zealous for the nation of Israel. He was zealous and ready to act, ready to defend the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead. He was upset by what had happened and was ready to make an advance against Nahash and his forces. He was zealous. You know, I see in the text that he was fervent in spirit because after all, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. Saul wasn't acting as Saul in this moment. Saul was acting through the spirit of God. The spirit of God was directing him as he, as he was stirred up by what had happened in Jabesh Gilead. While all those who were acting in the flesh were mourning in hopelessness, thinking that there was nothing to be done, the spirit of the Lord was stirring up Saul and moving him to act, equipping him for service, using him to be the deliverer of God's people. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And it says in verse number 6, when he heard those tidings, and his anger was kindled greatly. I don't know about you, but uh, that's interesting to me. Because personally, I don't like getting angry. In fact, I try not to get angry. Can't say I'm perfect, but I try not to get angry. And... Uh, I believe that anger is a destroyer. We need to be careful, very careful with anger. And I could preach a whole series of messages from the Bible against anger. And yet from this text, I'll tell you this. We could use a little anger against the devil. We could use a little anger against sin. It would do us good to have this zeal, this righteous indignation against our great enemy. You know, we should be upset with the devil. We should be upset when he's allowed to have his way in a heart or in a home. We should be upset when we see the devil leading a loved one down the path of sin, down the path of destruction. We shouldn't be okay with that. It should affect us. You know, we get angry and anger is wrong because we get angry about selfish things, don't we? We get angry when we don't get what we want. Like Liliana, if you tell her no. Uh, Bethany was talking to someone after church on Sunday morning and saying, you know, you know, when it's testimony time or something, I just can't tell her no because if I tell her no, she'll throw a fit. You know, but at home, uh, I'll, say, I, I'll tell her no there. And I said, Bethany, just be honest. There are times at home when we say yes to Lily because we don't want her to throw a fit. <laughs> she gets angry. She gets upset. And that's, you know, the children, we see it, but that's how, we, that's how we are as people. We get angry when we don't get what we want. But our Savior, he got angry for his Father. He said, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Do you have a zeal for God's house, a zeal for righteousness? I read in this text and I read Saul responding to the message and taking that yoke of oxen and hewing it in pieces. We say, what in the world is he doing? Well, I have read the New Testament of when our Savior took a scourge and drove out all the money exchangers, money sellers out of the temple. But there he is hewing this yoke of oxen in pieces, sending it into the coasts of Israel, calling for all of them to come and fight this battle and reminds us that God wants us to fight this battle against sin. And on a personal letter, le level, now I'm so glad that the Lord cared enough about me to respond with such zeal to rescue me from sin. I'm so thankful that he was willing to move heaven and earth just to save a sinner like me. You see, the zeal that Saul showed on this day when Jabesh Gilead was in trouble is the zeal that God always shows when his children are in trouble. You remember in Psalm 18, the ironic thing about Psalm 18 is that's the psalm that David wrote when he had delivered him from all his enemies, including the enemy Saul. But in Psalm 18, David writes in verse number 6, In my distress I called upon the Lord, and cried unto my God. 
He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, the Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Then the channels of water were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke. O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils, he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, he delivered me from my strong enemy, and from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. Praise the Lord for his zeal, his zeal in saving us from our great enemy. We see a, his great zeal, then secondly, we see a great host a great host in verse number eight. And when he numbered them in Bezek, the children of Israel were 300,000 and the men of Judah, 30,000. There Nahash is saying, go ahead and send through all the coast of Israel. See if you can find a man. See if you can find any man that will come to help you. So confident that they're all alone. So confident that nobody will care. And how surprised he must have been that morning when there were 330,000 that came against him. 330,000 that marched against his armies that day. And yet I'm reminded today that God for us has done the same, that he spared no resources in providing our salvation. He provides for us his very best. He gave us his son, his only begotten son to save us from our sin. And for Christians, you know that when you call him today, when you call on him today, the hosts of heaven are all ready to act on your behalf. In James chapter five, James is talking to those who are suffering, those that are being treated unjustly. And he says to them that their cry has entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. And the name Lord of Sabaoth means the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies of heaven, the Lord of the armies of heaven and earth. He hears our cry and he promises to act on our behalf, a great host. Then we see thirdly here, the great victory. There was a great zeal, there was a great host, and then there's a great victory. In verse number nine, we read of their attack. First they come to Jabesh Gilead. They send messengers there. And they say to them in verse 9, Tomorrow by that time the sun be hot, ye shall have help. And the messengers came and showed it to the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. They were glad. You know, that brings great joy when you know the Lord is on your side. And then it's, they plot more in verse 10. Therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will come out unto you, and ye shall do with us all that seemeth good unto you. There he's telling Nahash, listen, we'll come. There's nobody come to help us. You can, you can, we'll keep the covenant, you know, just pluck out our eyes tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, Nahash is there so confident, believing that they're so, so defeated that he's completely unprepared for the next morning. When Saul and his armies invade his camp in three waves they come, three divided them into to three camps there, and, or three, three hosts it says in the, no, three companies it says in the text. And they come against Nahash the Ammonite and his armies. And it was a quick victory. It was before the sun got hot, it was over. They came in the morning watch, and by the time the sun got hot, there remained not two of the, not, so that they were so scattered, so that two of them were not left together. 
just like that, the battle was over. The victory was won. It was a great victory. Now, that's what Jesus did for us. It's a great victory. The moment, the moment we called on his name, the moment we said, Lord, help me, the moment we said, the moment we said, Lord, I need you, Lord, come into my heart and save me, the moment we called on his name, it was over. He saved us that very moment. It was a great victory, a complete victory. He bruised the serpent under his feet. He cut off the serpent's head. He gives us a complete victory. And it's a great day of deliverance. They went from being overwhelmed, from being hopeless and helpless, to experiencing that great victory. A day of great trouble, a day of great deliverance. And last of all, it was a day of great grace. A day of great grace. Needless to say, we, we said it on Sunday night, our Savior ushered in the day of grace, the age of grace. And uh, in our text, we see great grace come from the man in the Bible you'd probably least expect it, but from Saul. Great grace. First of all, we see his great mercy, demonstrated by his great mercy. In verse 12 and 13, after the battle is over, it says, And the people said unto Samuel, who is he that said, shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. And Saul said, there shall not a man be put to death this day. For today the Lord hath wrought salvation in Israel. Remember when Saul was chosen as king in front of all the people, there were sons of Belial who said, how shall this man save us? And they despised him and they brought him no presents. But he held his peace. Well, today, Saul, is your day to get revenge. Today is your day to, 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 to kill these ones that have opposed you. But Saul didn't, didn't get revenge. Saul said, the Lord brought this victory. The Lord's brought this great deliverance. So no man shall be put to death. He showed great mercy even to those that had opposed him just days before. And how it reminds us of our Savior who while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Reminds us of our Savior when he was on the tree. He did not pray for vengeance, but he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I'm thankful for the mercy and kindness he showed to me in saving me, because we were like those enemies, weren't we? As the songwriter put it, years I spend in vanity and pride, Caring not, my Lord was crucified. Knowing not, it was for me he died at Calvary. Mercy there was great, and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Great grace demonstrated by great mercy. Also, you see great grace demonstrated by great joy, evidenced by their great joy. In verse 14, Samuel says, let's go renew the kingdom at Gilgal. Verse 15, they go down to Gilgal and they, they make Saul king. They offer sacrifices of peace offerings. And then it says at the end of the verse, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Oh, think of the grace extended there to the nation of Israel. These people that had demanded to God, give us a king. God's being so good to them. Not only does God give them a king, but he gives them a king who delivers them. And they have great joy. They rejoiced greatly. You know, salvation always brings great joy. Oh, happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Savior, and my God. It's a day of great rejoicing, the day we're saved. And then lastly, it's evidenced by great thanksgiving, by great thanksgiving. One of the, I remember in college, always having these speakers come through and uh, the college chapel time. And one year at Thanksgiving time, this preacher came through and he preached a Thanksgiving message. And do you know what his text was? It was First Samuel chapter 11. You say, how in the world is this a Thanksgiving text? Well, 
because there was no one in the world as thankful as these men in Jabesh Gilead. Think of the grace that God showed them. Uh, Nahash was so confident that Jabesh Gilead wouldn't get any help. Why is that? Well, I wonder if he knew the history of Jabesh Gilead. The history of Jabesh Gilead is not a good history. In the olden days, it actually was in Gibeah of Saul back in the time of the judges that a great sin took place in the tribe of Benjamin. And they had to deal with this great sin and come against the tribe of Benjamin because they wouldn't give up the men that had done this great wickedness. And so they come against Benjamin. They call the whole country together. And they all come. Except they find out that one city didn't come. One city wasn't willing to fight. Do you know what city that was? That was Jabesh Gilead. Jabesh Gilead stayed home that day. Jabesh Gilead didn't come when everyone else came to battle together. And so now Jabesh Gilead is the one in trouble. Well, human reasoning would say, well, no mercy needed for them. They didn't come and help us, so why will we come and help them? But that's not how God's economy works. That's just how man thinks. And although Jabesh Gilead, you know, in the world's mind, grace has to be earned. But grace, by definition, is God's unmerited favor. And the fact that Jabesh Gilead didn't deserve grace had no bearings on God's pouring out his grace on them. God is long-suffering and of great mercies. He is the God of all grace. And he was interested in saving even Jabesh Gilead. And I submit to you this evening that Jabesh Gilead they never got over this grace. We, we know the story of Saul. We know how he got off track. We know how he became the exact opposite of what he was supposed to be and ultimately was persecuting the one who was then anointed to be king in his place and pursuing David to caves and mountains and all these different places. But when Saul died in battle in 1 Samuel chapter 31, we read that the Philistines then, they desecrated his body. They took his body, they hung it on the wall, him and his sons, and they just were terrible to it. Well, the Bible tells us that there came a group of the nation of Israel by night. They came all night. They left their hometown. They came, went all night, and they went to the wall of Bethshan, and they took, they took the bodies of Saul and his son from the wall of Bethshan, and they took them home to their city and burned them and buried their bones and fasted for them seven days, risked their lives to give Saul, of all people, a proper burial. It makes no sense, except then you read, the men were from the city of Jabesh Gilead. It was these people, the ones that he rescued, they're the ones that gave him a proper burial years later. They were grateful never got over the grace that Saul had shown to them. You know, Christian, we should never get over the grace that God's shown to us. God's been so good to us in saving us, been so kind to us in rescuing us in the day of trouble. We ought always to be thankful for what he's done, sing his praises, and live our lives for his honor and glory. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this text as we think of these men in Jabesh Gilead. Lord, so much to be learned from them. And Lord, as they were so helpless at the beginning, but at the end they were willing to risk their lives for their king. Lord, I pray that we'll be like that. We were helpless. We were hopeless without you. But you saved us by your grace. And now, Lord, I pray that we'll live our lives for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.